Um, let's go to the uh, Lord on behalf of Maui and uh, the city. That city, uh, what's the name of that city? It starts with an L, I can't remember. Lanai. 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 Okay. Particularly that city, but people in Maui, they were all over Maui were affected because I'm sure there was a lot of their friends and uh, and uh, relatives in that city. And who knows how many have died, only God knows so far, but uh, it's, it's bound to be pretty extensive. Let's pray for them. Uh, Father, we come before you and uh, we we pray that you would uh, undertake there in the Hawaiian Islands, Maui and uh, Lahana, or whatever the name of that city is, Lord, you know it, and uh, you're well aware of it. I ask you to undergird them, uh, give uh, plenty of people there to help uh, restore whatever can be restored and to meet the needs of those that have lost family members and friends and so forth. It's a, it's a tragedy, no doubt. And, um, and I ask you to touch them and keep them, lift them up. Um, send those that uh, are well trained in the scripture uh, because people will be seeking God um, that they might be able to take the word of God and lead those that need Jesus to him in salvation but not only that to help people gain control of their own emotions and uh, the things in their lives that need to be worked on they will see the tragedy and what can happen in life and maybe someone there would decide that they need to change their own life and they can't do it but we know you can and father we praise you for what you'll do that you meet each need and help the uh, send plenty of people to help them uh, food water uh, medical supplies, whatever is necessary, Lord. We ask you to send them and bless them. In the name of Jesus, amen and amen. amen. We're going to be in Second uh, Corinthians today. And this is Paul's exhortation to the Corinthian church. Now, you know, this is the second letter. And... The content of the first letter that he sent them, which would be 1 Corinthians, uh, the context of it was idolatry, immorality, and divisions in the church. Now, <clears throat> this was not a Jewish-based church. It was uh, basically a Gentile church. And so uh, people got saved, but they, they uh, didn't have a firm grasp on what that meant. And they continued in their sin, and, and so uh, God needed to correct this. Uh, because a church that's living in sin is of very little value uh, to the world. And so he wrote them a second letter. And we're going to be in chapter 7. And uh, we will start in verse 8. He says in verse 8 of chapter 7, 2 Corinthians, For though I made you sorry with a letter, that was the first letter, I do not repent. I'm not sorry I did it. Though I did repent in the sense that I had to do it. For I perceive that the same epistle hath made you sorry. 
though it were for a season, but a season, or a little time. And let me uh, anglicize this a little. Though I had to make you sorry to get your heart attention, I do not regret doing so, for it was necessary to write you and make you sorryful enough to make a change at this time or before it becomes too late to do so. He was sorry he had to write them. Well, I understand that. Uh, we see churches every day in America now that are not doing what they're supposed to be doing. They're living in sin, a lot of them. They believe doctrines that are not even from the Word of God. And we had a great Sunday school lesson this morning about that. And Bobby did a great job with that. I thank you for that. And what we had to do, or what he had to do, was to get them to pay attention. Look, you are supposed to be uh, a, a group of Christian people, but within your ranks, now not everybody there, of course, but within their ranks, there were people who were still idolaters, worshiping everything and anything. There was immorality, there was sexual immorality, and there were divisions where each person, little groups thought this and another one this, and and they were really struggling. Verse 9, it says, um, Now I rejoice, not that you were made sorry, but you sorrowed to repentance, for you were made sorry after a godly manner. Now you might, that you might receive uh, uh, damage by us in nothing. Now, let me explain a little something. Where you see that phrase, uh, uh, godly uh, sorrow, uh, or sorrow after a godly manner, uh, let me explain that a little bit. When I was a kid, I would get in trouble. And uh, uh, my dad had, a, had an old leather belt. I tried every way in the world to get rid of that belt. I'll tell you that right now. But he had it and he kept it stored up. And if I got in trouble, I got the belt. And, and I sure was sorry that I got that with me. But you know, I found that I wasn't sorry about what I'd done. Now, how did I know that I was not sorry about what I had done? You did it again. I did it again. Several times again, probably. So the point here is that he sent him a letter, and he was sorry he had to send it, but somebody had to tell them they needed to change. I'm telling you. There's some pastors in America that need to tell their churches they need to change. There's things going on in churches that ought not ever be named in a church. And I'm not going to call any names, but I can tell you there's some pretty big churches out there that are not really preaching the Word of God. So sometimes what we are compelled by God to say to others, compelled to say it to them in a corrective manner, to help them. It's not a, uh, you know, uh, a real angry or a, or a situation where uh, something bad is going to happen to you people if you don't change. It's not in that tone. It's in a corrective manner. Although something bad might happen to them if they don't change. For their own good. In a corrective manner for their own good. That makes them and even us sorrowful. 
I've had to tell people uh, in churches and and other places uh, things that I didn't really want to have to tell people. Um, I did because um, it was required. It was necessary. But I didn't really want to. Because nobody wants to be put in that position. But sometimes you just have to. We have to tell our children things that we uh, wish that we didn't have to tell them sometimes. Uh, my dad, when he gave me a whipping with the belt, he said, this is going to hurt me more than it hurts you. And I, I, I finally one day, I said, I don't think so, Dad. And um, uh, the truth is, it did hurt him. It bothered him greatly. Not only because he had to give me a whipping, but because I had done something that he had to do it. And so we see those kinds of things, and, and, uh, uh, and it makes both of us sorrowful. Uh, us, because it was necessary, yet it made uh, them have sorrow because their life, their lifestyle of sin. Have you ever had to do this with someone? Ever had to talk to somebody about their sinful lifestyle and how they needed to change? Well, I get opportunities and do on, uh, on occasion, or several occasions. But when it produced a sorrow to repentance, now give me, he had to tell them to bring them to the understanding that they were living outside of the guidelines of the Bible, the truth of the Word of God. They were living in a way that was going to bring destruction upon themselves physically and in other ways, financially, uh, in their uh, blessing from God. God's not going to bless a church that will not change and come out of sin. He has trouble blessing them. It doesn't mean he three, but he cannot give them the blessings that he wants to give them. Now, but when they sorrowed to repentance, there was a godly change in them. And that's what takes place in repentance. We were going this way, away from God, and we discerned, we discerned that we were not living for Christ. And we made a U-turn. And we headed back this way toward God. Because we knew the only way to go in life is toward God. Through Christ. And so they did. But it produced a, a, that sorrow of repentance. And, and they turned around to God, not by their, their will but by God's will as the Spirit of God transformed them. In uh, Romans chapter 12, it says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies uh, a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God. And now look over there, and let's look at verse uh, two. That was verse 1, Romans chapter 12, verse 2. Um, and it says, And be not conformed to this world. Don't be changed and, uh, and live like the world. Don't, don't allow the world to govern you. Allow the Spirit of God through the Word of God to govern you. So it is, would not be uh, your will, but God's will, and going on with that verse, uh, be transformed formed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and perfect will of God in you. Now, if you do that, if you have a problem, if a church has a problem, if somebody you know has a problem with this, 
who claims to be a Christian, they need to read this. They need to hear this. And let God uh, change them. And be not conformed to this world, but be you transformed. That means be you changed. When you get saved, you become a new creature. And does that mean a creature like the ghoul? Like uh, something? What's that mean? It means a new creation. You become another person. You get saved, you're, you're changed on the inside. And, you're, and when you're changed on the inside, the outside changes with you if you're living it. And um, praise God that that's the way He works. Now in verse 10, He said to them, For godly sorrow works repentance to salvation, not to be repented of, not to be changed. Repentance means change, but change for the good. And he's saying that the godly sorrow, the realization that you have sinned and needs to be repented of, uh, wells up inside of us a desire to uh, repent of that sin as quickly as possible. I, my, our uh, preacher at Gilead there in uh, in Macon, he said, keep a short account of sin. Don't let sin come in and hide in you and you endure it and just uh, try to put it aside and not address it. As soon as you know you have sinned, repent of it right then and ask God to take that away and give you victory. And you watch what happens in your life if you're struggling in that way. And he said, uh, uh, through that sorrow came understanding that as a sinner, the ramifications of sin can have worldly consequences for this life. Well, there's all kinds of things that can come from sin. A sickness can come from sin. A poverty can come from sin. Lack of God's blessing can come from sin. And unless it's changed, it goes on and on and on until it finishes. And we know what the consequences are to an ungodly world. And that's eternal death to an unbeliever. And this understanding can bring repentance, which is regret and willingness to experience godly inspired change. I know I've told you before, when I got saved, I fell flat on my face in front of God. And I said, I am a sinner unsaved. And immediately my mind went to the things that how I live my life. In between that time I thought I'd gotten saved or thought I was okay or whatever it was I thought. And the day I truly got saved. And I thought, as I've said to you all before, I spent 25 years basically in, well, I spent 37 years, but 25 uh, just kind of cruising along in sin. And I thought, what I could have done if I'd have gotten saved when I should have gotten saved. Made, it would have made a big difference in me and my family and people I knew. Godly inspired change through the Spirit and the Word. That's what he was exhorting. He's exhorting them. I'm telling you, he wrote them a scathing letter in First Corinthians. You need to go home and read that letter. 
That'll bring you to your knees. But he went back. When they started to change, he went back and he said, look, I'm sorry I had to write it, but look at you now. You ever seen a church on fire for God? I mean, a large church just, just praising God. Man, I love that. Praising God. Giving everything they have. <laughs> to God. Verse 11. For behold this self-same thing that you sorrowed after a godly sort and it brought into their lives a couple of things. First of all, <coughs> it brought to them everlasting life. And it brought also to them a bottle of water. <laughs> Sorry to you that are watching on our website. I had to give water. All right, so it brought everlasting life. Well, everything starts in a, in a Christian with everlasting life, doesn't it? I mean, we may be affected by Christianity around us, and we may be even thinking about it because God's uh, Spirit is working in us. But the real change is, comes when we say, I know I'm a sinner, and as a sinner, I'm condemned to hell, and a life that's not very enticing, and... I don't want to be that anymore. I want to be a godly person living my life for you. So it brings everlasting life. And secondly, it brings purity in living your life now uh, through these changes that have been made in your heart. It changes your way you approach life. Um, I no longer wanted the things that I had before I was saved. I mean, I was so changed it was it was obvious. My mother-in-law, she knew how wicked I really was, and um, she came down. She used to come down and see, stay with us and so forth. I was in that YDC ministry. I was out of, out of the house at night just about all, just about all week long. On Sunday, we had a church down in the Macon Rescue Mission downtown the, uh, Macon on Poplar. Uh, and I was ministering to people. I was not a pastor yet. But I was ministering to the YDCs and the jails and the Macon Rescue Mission and things. And she went home and told her family, Donna's family. She said, you're not going to believe that guy. That's not the same man. I mean, he's not even close to the same man. This man gives his life to people. And I'm not just, I'm not bragging, I'm just saying that if we have that, this change, it makes a difference. It should make a difference. And we were, we sorrowed after that godly sort and our lives were changed and we became something that we were not before. You were not holy before you were saved. You were not righteous before you were saved. You uh, were justified, the other word for that. You were not a lot of things before you trusted in Christ. But he's saying now there's a difference. Now I get a report about you and it's a, it's a stunning report about how 
you're beginning to live your lives in that church. So in this chain, verse 11, there are seven changes, seven things that after salvation and purity in life, holiness, you're declared to be holy. You're declared to be righteous. Justification. They're set, are showing up in your life. Now listen to these. The first one is what carefulness, he says. He says, after a godly sort, a sort what carefulness it worked in you. Now, carefulness uh, in some parts of the scripture, the word used for careful or carefulness, the word that it came from, uh, was the word that meant caution. Uh, Ephesians, it means caution. What caution it worked in you, and it can mean that here. But uh, in this particular case, <clears throat> it is more profound in this sense. Carefulness is work in you. It comes from the word uh, spude uh, in the Greek, and it means uh, eagerness, earnestness, um, diligence, and it, these things makes us go after godly change with all speed. Godly change with all speed. I'm not going to wait around. I'm not going to sit back and just let life go on and know I'm saved and not do anything and not try to be a better person through the Word of God and the Spirit of God. No, I'm not going to do that. No, I'm going to be different. I'm going to be changed. This is the approach that God wants. I'm going to be what you want me to be. And let me tell you, when you find a group of people who are what God wants them to be, things are happening. The second thing is, what clearing of yourselves? Well, that's from apologia or apology. Apology for your sin to God as you answer for your actions. It's a legal plea. God, I've lived my life in sin. You could tell somebody that you know has lived their life in sin and you're dealing with them. You tell God that you know you're a sinner and you know uh, that He knows you're a sinner. And give answer for your actions as a legal plea. And what would that be? That would be to ask for mercy. Anybody here ever ask for mercy? God be merciful to me, a sinner. Boy, well, I have. And I don't mean before, just when I got saved. I mean since then, as I was growing in Christ, I would do something, well, I would go, wow, that was not right. God, forgive me and be merciful to me for that and help me to never do that again. So they were really starting to change and asking for mercy perhaps. And number three, what indignation. Uh, indignation uh, is... Uh, well, it's from Agonachesis, uh, but it means resentment. Uh, this word, the root word, means resentment. What resentment? Well, resentment to God? Toward God? Uh, I don't think so. I think it's uh, toward another being. And the only other being that it could be against uh, that could have eternal consequences would be Satan. So when I got saved, and maybe when you got saved, and we see here in this church, when some of them got saved, they had a resentment 
and uh, uh, toward Satan they had an anger toward themselves for the way that they had treated God before they trusted Him. Sometimes we look back and we get angry at ourselves. Well, we don't have to because we've been forgiven. It's good, though, to remember some things sometimes to keep you from going on uh, and doing things that may be wrong. Sometimes it's good to look back and say, here's what I was, and look what I am today. And not in a boastful manner, but in the, in the, uh, the praise of God of how He's changed you. Everybody here can tell, you, tell us how you've been changed, how your life is different from, the, from before you were saved until now after you've grown in Christ. Should be some difference there. And the fourth thing, what fear? Well, that's from Phobos, and we know that's phobia. Uh, it's fright. And in becoming, uh, well, I, I believe some of us have had and may still have a fright of returning back to what they were before. Now, I had a little of that in me in the beginning because I knew uh, what I was before I was saved. And I had some fear about going back to that. Um, I got rid of every friend I had. I had no friends. Well, they didn't want me as a friend either because I, I told them about Jesus. But, um, but they didn't, uh, I didn't want them either because they were doing things I couldn't do. I didn't want to do and I was afraid sometimes that I might uh, fall back into that. I had to see myself grow some. You know what I'm saying? I saw a guy one time hit, get a hit by a baseball, a pitch. He was crowding the plate, and... We kept telling him, we said, if you get closer than that to the plate, you're going to get hit. And this boy was on the mound. He could throw a baseball. And he got hit. And, you know, he became so fearful of getting hit that the next time he came up to the plate, the bat wouldn't even cover the whole plate. So he went from a guy who crowded the plate and very aggressive to a guy who uh, was uh, timid, afraid of getting hit with the baseball. You know. We don't have to worry about that, but we ought always to be aware of our surroundings. Amen? What am I getting influenced by today? What's the influence? And be careful with that. Number five, um, oh, number four, the, 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 the last of that was to reverence God. Hold Him in reverential uh, esteem and, um, and hold Him in great standing. Five is what vehement desire, epipothesis, to long for or earnestly desire God. Now that's a good that's a good phrase, but what's that mean? Well, to long for or earnestly desire God is to have all of it. Who wants part of God? And if you want part of God, what part do you want? See, I don't want part of God. I want all of God. I want everything He has for His believers. And I want all that, um, that He will give me in my life uh, in blessing, and I want all that He will give me in spiritual awareness and 
ability to do his work. I want all of you. But guess what? He wants all of you too. He wants every bit of us. Everything. And we need to do that. What vehement desire, the earnestly uh, desiring God to intensely crave His Word and power in your life. Well, I want His power in my life. And I want Him. And number six is what zeal, and it comes from zealous, to glow in our fervor to be like Christ. Now, some of you glow all the time and some don't glow all the time. But all of us glow sometimes. Something happens in our life that God does in our lives and we get a little glow to us. Like Give, he gave our dear brother back there in the back, Ralph, he gave him a great, great grandchild. Well, now I know you were jumping around with joy, right, Ralph? And you were happy, weren't you? That's what I was. And don't you know that was a gift of God? Absolutely. Yeah. And you know why? Because they have stood for God, for Christ, in their lives, he and his wife. They don't they can't do as much today, but they can still, as much as he can, he comes to church and they trust Christ for everything. And what a praise that is. And there's a glow about a person who's living. Praising God. And last but not least, what revenge? <coughs> what revenge against Satan? <coughs> By giving control, no. By gaining control, of your life through Jesus Christ. What's a name, what's one of the names that that should be dear to us and has an effect upon us that's a name for Christ? And a name for us too, if we're believers. Father. Huh? Father. Well, that's a good name, yeah. But I'm talking about a working name. All right? What is it we can do every day? We face Satan every day of our life. Now, sometimes we don't fare too well. We overcome. He is a great overcomer. You see, with him, we can overcome Satan. And living... In Christ, in fact, look with me at Revelation and I'll, I'll be done. I, I stayed a little longer because I thought everybody needed to be hungry when you left here. Well fed on the Word, but hungry for food. Uh, Romans, I mean, uh, Revelation chapter 12, verses 10 and 11 says, and I heard a loud voice in heaven, saying in heaven, Now is come salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ. For the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night. And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb, not by the flesh, not by our flesh and our will, but by the will of God and the blood of, of the Lamb, and by the word of their testimony, and they loved not their lives unto death. And so we see that we overcome because 
He is the great overcomer. He overcame Satan. He overcame death. He overcame hell. He overcame the grave. And we will too. And that's a great letter right there, that Second Corinthians chapter 7, because he told those people that they were now overcomers and they had gained victory in a lot of areas in their lives. And you know that seven is God's number for what? Completion. That's right. So we're complete in Him for salvation and, and having all the gifts that He needs to give us and so forth. Maybe we need to be more complete in some of the areas that we discussed in this message. And if you do, pray to Him and He'll tell, He'll help you. If you want it bad enough, God will give it to you. I believe it with everything that's in me. I've seen him do it too many times. Anybody got something you'd like to share this morning real quick?